photographer, you do have to have a certain amount of uh, calm collectedness because basically, especially in the television world, you're really the one constant on a series that's the creative constant there on the floor. Uh, the directors that come and go are guests, uh, unless you're someone lucky like your brother, Adam, who, uh, for example, would get Shorty did more than half of all the episodes. And that, for me, is the best scenario as well, because we you learn a shorthand. But I've got to be prepared to meet with and discuss and learn the techniques of new directors every eight days. And so you have to be cool and collected and just keep a semblance of calm uh, working with, because otherwise the, the ship sinks. It's got to keep right. moving. Yeah. Right. Uh, that, that leads us into a question that one of my, my students um, brought up and, and that he was interested in was if, if you could speak a little bit to that collaborative relationship between the director and the cinematographer. What, what do you look for in that? What is, what's the ideal? Uh, what does it often end up being working? I'm sure it's different working in television rather than working in film. Very good question. Again, I think the there are a couple of things. Television is drastically different because of what we were just talking about. Every eight days, you often get a new director onto an episodic series. So what's interesting about that is some directors are very technically uh, technical. Uh, often they, they used to be cinematographers, so they used to be an editor, or they used to be, they come out of some technical background of filmmaking. And so they'll know all the technical things that they want. Some directors are actors or were actors or still acting where they're much more in tune with, act, with, with the acting side of it. And some are both, your, your brother, for example, knows both. He's very technical and he's very good with the actors. But I love collaborating with both these types of directors. Some of them need more of my help in terms of blocking scenes and figuring out how the, the, the camera is gonna tell the story. Uh, and others know exactly when I work with uh, a cinematographer that, or, or a director that used to be a cinematographer, they will they'll go give me an 18 millimeter lens here. We're going to dolly from here to here. We're going to boom up. We're going to and everything's done for me in that way. So sometimes that actually is a little more boring for me. I'm less challenged. I like to I like to collaborate and figure out scenes with actors. Right. If that makes um sense. No, it, it does. Uh, you know, one of one of the things I noticed that I loved when working with you and Adam on Get Shorty was that very private rehearsal time with just the two of you and Eric, the 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 first. Mm -hmm. And there was that sense of privacy and that sense of of building the scene and then figuring out how to shoot it because stuff was growing naturally out of what the actors were doing. Uh, now, of course, that changes at times depending on the exigencies of the set or action that has to take place in the scene. Uh, but, but that felt very organic, whereas I've been on some shows where there's this feeling that you have to shoehorn your performance into a cookie cutter... Uh, uh, right process that they already have determined before any actors show up. That's that's very true. I've, I've always, regardless of which director I'm working with, if I'm working on a TV series and I'm the regular cinematographer on the series, I will always uh, talk the production or talk the, the showrunners into having private blockings for every scene, even before, you know, for every director, because it does two things. It gives us a unified front. It gives the actors a chance to run the lines and to try a few things before we show the crew everything. And, and that's what keeps the actors in collaboration with us. That's what keeps the two of us uh, working together smoothly. And it makes the machine go a lot faster and smoother where, where you don't feel as an actor shoehorned into a certain type of blocking. Obviously there are some things that need to be done within the scene that are dictated. And also by the set, if the, if a windows are on one side of a set, you don't want all the actors standing against a white wall because every close up is going to look uniform and boring. You want to give yeah. it some style and some. So there's those there are those elements. But in general, we kind of uh, Adam will give his ideas, or any director uh, that's that's a seasoned director will give their ideas in that private blocking, and uh, we'll work it through with the actors. And by the time we invite the crew in, which doesn't take that long, everyone feels comfortable. The actors feel comfortable. 
I do, the director does. So it's the best way to go. Well, what I'm hoping is that, you know, I, I have two sets of students. I have my, my, my acting students up here in L.A., and then I have my film students who are screenwriters and cine students and editors down at, at Chapman University. Uh, and I'm hoping that a lot of my acting students are watching because I know that when I was growing up and I, I wanted to be an actor and that was my focus, and I didn't – I was probably the person in the family – who early on had the least interest in any other aspect of filmmaking. You know, I was ah, like, okay. I was tunnel vision on being an actor. Um, my younger brother, Tony, Adam, obviously my dad, very interested in, in all aspects of cinema, but I was tunnel vision um, until I, until I was older and started directing a little bit in theater and then started learning more about cinema. And what was amazing to me was how often other actors like me thought, you know, I'm the tip of the spear and I'm telling the story. Right. And later I realized, I, I've come to realize how little of the story I am actually telling as an actor <laughs> and how much of the story is being told by the DP, by the sound design, by the, the subtext in in the production design, in the camera angle, so much storytelling is there. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. And and what the the way one of my students was was looking to get into that was he was asking what he was curious about. What is your first read of a screenplay like? What are what are you look? Because I know as an actor what I'm looking at. So what I'll do first, and it's, it's funny because I think this is my 25th year as a director of photography. And I think with, that's over, I don't know, I think I've done over 300 episodes of television, different, you know, one hours in that time with over 100 different directors. And wow. there's one commonality, and that's when you read the, the, when I read the script for the first time, it's, I want to just enjoy it for what it is. I don't think about it technically. I don't think about anything. I want to read the story and I want what does that story do to me emotionally? And I think you guys as actors or actors in general will do the same thing. That's that, that's the recommended way to go. It's just well, that's what I and how, how does it make you feel? Yeah, so that's, that's what for I tell sure. my to do because most of them look to pick up a script and they're just looking to see where's my part. Yeah. And I tell them, no, no, don't look for your part first. Just read it. Everyone wants to kind of focus in on their own craft like I could read this script the first time and think about oh my god where's that light going to come from are we going to do it night exterior is it going to be lightning is it going to be an orange you know start breaking it down technically just like you would pick as an actor where your lines come in but the thing is just enjoy it for the read enjoy the story and what does it emotionally what does that story emotionally do for you then I'll do a second pass of the script and I'll just making it I'll start making a couple of notes that now are concerning me about some ideas that I may have, because the first time you read it, already in the back of your head, there's some visual cues and things going on about how I imagine, and I'm not the director, so I'm there, my job, any director of photography's job, is to service the director's vision, first and foremost. So, however, with a good collaboration, I can have a lot, and often do, have a lot to do with how the end result looks. So I like to play a little game with myself where I, I make notes on the script, first pass, and then as we go through the production meeting closer to shooting, I'll kind of add some notes, and I'll see in the end how close the director's vision was with mine. I'm still there to service the director, but often, especially where I've worked multiple times with the same director, uh, it's, it's uncanny how the end result of the one-hour episode or the movie, whatever that may be, uh, the end result is very close to what was in my brain that by the second time that I read the script. Interesting. Uh, interesting. You know, that's. And um, do you find working with, uh, you, you may have touched on this a little bit, but when you're working with uh, somebody who comes into it as an actor first uh, and became a director, that you have to do a lot of handholding? Not really. The, the, the most difficult time that I ever have, and it, it's, this isn't just limited to actors, but when you have a director that for some reason doesn't want 
my help. In other words, they may not be technically savvy. They may not know the right way to put a scene together, really. But they will still insist on their way of doing it without any help. Because I think, I don't know if it's ego. I don't know. And frankly, that doesn't happen very often at all. With It doesn't, it, it's pretty rare. I would say out of 30 directors, it'll happen like maybe once or twice out of 30 different experiences. Where it, because... It's not that I'm trying to shove a, a certain look or a thing down the act, the director's throat. It's that I'm trying to help make it visually look as interesting as it possibly can. And and those those people that need my help, if they take it, we're going to come up with a great episode. The people that don't need my help and they do a good job themselves, also a great episode. Where it doesn't work out mm -hmm. is if you need my help but you don't want to listen to any ideas. <laughs> that's that's the hard one. Okay. Well, if uh, if I'm ever lucky enough to be directing something and you're my DP, I'll just say, how are we going to shoot that? <laughs> That's awesome. And I think we both have a fun time doing it, too. Um, I, uh, another question I had was, you know, you, you mentioned about making it look interesting. Um, what Can you speak a bit to how the idea of uh, subtext plays into your your shot planning for a, a sequence. So you've got you've got the the literal story that you're telling. Yeah. But then there are also aspects of the story. I mean, the you know the the simplest one is you know shoot from below to show power, shoot from above to show you know. But how does that stuff play into you? Because I I recently saw um, the movie Force Majeure. Yes. Did you see that is it's Swedish, right? Is it Swedish or Norwegian? And was really struck by how sort of the subtext of the way it was shot, what the the position they were putting the audience in as it almost felt like documentary observer. You know, we're putting the camera here and it's not going to move, and some action may pass in front of the camera. Yeah. And and sometimes the action would move off camera, but you knew the scene was still going on. The camera wasn't moving, and it uh, it told a lot about the subtext of the of the film. I felt a lot of that work has to be, and not has to be, but for my job, for my job category as a DP, that's something that I have to discuss with the director in prep because. And or even at, on the day, but on the day that we're filming, but off, you know the day that you're filming, and you're very aware of this, of how much work has to get done in in any given day on a on a set, and it's a lot. So you want to figure out as much in prep as you can. And we'll talk about subtext. We'll talk about what the character has been through before. If the if the scene calls for a, a scene in the bedroom, and it's a character that's just gone through the ringer the last you know couple of episodes or last few scenes. You don't want to do a bright, happy lighting scene with with you know beautiful lighting on them in, in the bedroom. You want it to look stark and harsh and hard, and and you want to feel the pain that that character is going through. And a lot of that can be helped with the lighting and the camera angles, or and the camera movement. Uh, I do a show right now. I'm waiting to go back to Boston after well, whenever we're given the green light, called the Society, and it's kind of a Lord of the Flies type scenario for Netflix. It's like a teen. Thing, but Mark Webb was the uh, pilot director and he said, look, I want to feel like I'm one of those kids the entire series in this group. I don't want to feel like fancy camera moves. I don't want to feel... So the whole series pretty much is done with a handheld camera and even the telephoto long lens stuff where the camera is moving quite a bit, but it, it adds such a, such a tension to the series and attention to what these characters are going through and their backstories that it really is another care that the camera becomes another actor in the story. So you're inside that you're going to be spending a lot of time inside the circle of action in the circle of action. That's right. right. Okay. Right. You're one of the, you're one of the people we rarely do masters. I mean, we, we shoot a master for the editor, a wide master shot, but if you watch that series, they rarely use them. It's, it's right. usually, it's usually you're right in there with the people and you're just one of the people that are involved in this story. Yeah. And you can feel very claustrophobic. You can create a great sense of claustrophobia too when you get that sense that, oh, the ac there's action happening behind me now. 
you know, I'm not, uh, it's, it's all around me rather than me. And I'm part of the story rather than just an observer. Absolutely. Right. Uh, so it's sort of the opposite of what they were doing in force majeure, where they were keeping <laughs> this, this emotional distance between you and, and the event and make it, it was almost like you were being tied into a chair and kept far away from it. Right. You're an audio, you're, you're, you're watching from a distance and these stoic, you know, wide compositions. That's yeah. also a, a great technique for, for storytelling and it completely changes the vibe. So absolutely. What, what, what for you have been, um, th throughout your career, um, the more interesting, uh, you know, fi film is a, is a relatively, uh, young language artistically. Um, so there've been since the Lumiere, there've been these leaps forward. Uh, what what for you have been times in your career where suddenly there was, you know, oh my God, we have this new way of looking at things, or we have this new tool, or we have. I mean, obviously, um, you can see the the tremendous change that drones have made. Oh, absolutely. For instance, absolutely. Well, I mean, just the whole obviously the the number one thing is the change from film to to digital. Uh, you know, in, in the early 2000s. I think uh, we're into t 2020 now. I think I was the first cinematographer to shoot a uh, miniseries for a major network on HD. And that was in, I think it was 2003. Um, it was a James Patterson book. And I'll, I'll remember the name in a minute. But um, it it became the pilot. It was like a backdoor pilot. It became the the Wives Murder, Murder Club or whatever that was. First, first, first wives, wives that, yeah. something like that. But uh, first to die—that's the name of the miniseries. And so we shot it with these Sony 900 HD cameras, and it was terrifying because it looked nothing like film. I'd come out of working all these fairly good-sized budget TV movies and miniseries on 35 millimeter film, and that had such a look. And suddenly, we're given these Sony plastic cameras to play with, which it was at the time, and it was like, oh my god! So I tried to wring out as much as I could out of it, but. That, that revolution to where we're at now, where 99% of the uh, product being shot, regardless of the budget of a feature, is being done in HD uh, on digital cameras is amazing. Drones, as you mentioned, I mean, obviously there, there are technologies right now on this series, uh, on the Netflix series, we're working with a Sony Venice camera. And actually with, with your brother, Adam, we also used it on uh, Get Shorty quite a bit. We use the same camera. And there's a device called a Rialto that comes with it. And it basically, the front of the camera unscrews, and you know, the, the camera is a full set, and the front of the camera unscrews and becomes the size of, uh, I don't know, like a, a pocketbook, basically. And you, a pocketbook with a lens on it. So there's a cable that'll run 20 feet, but suddenly you got this full blown motion picture camera that can fit on the dash of a car, that can fit on the floor by the gas pedal, that can flip, you know, in the fireplace next to the fire looking at the actors. I mean, ridiculously small spaces with a ridiculously amazing amount of quality. So that again is a game changer. It suddenly opens up creat creatively. It opens up the world of whole new types of shots to directors that never had that ability only a year ago. Yeah, so well, Adam was, Adam was talking about the, uh, the sequence where there was a, a very passionate love scene. That's right. And, and he said to you, can we, could, could one of the actors actually hold the, you know, while that's going on? And apparently it, it created uh, quite a... It, uh, it worked perfectly a, because it looked like they're hugging each other and uh, each, each actor took a turn holding the, the camera themselves, pointing at, putting them like a selfie and reacting like lovemaking. And, uh, and that, they were all over, bouncing all over the walls and it looked great. And, and it was... Uh, very realistic and very fun to do. So, and yeah. I think the the actors enjoy doing it as well. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, anytime you anytime you ask an actor to do something like that, although, although I had a, uh, I had a moment where I had to throw a uh, glass paperweight, theoretically through a plate glass window that they they were going to animate in the plate glass window, uh. and the paperweight was about the size of a softball, weighed about seven pounds. And uh, 
I, I can't throw to save my life. <laughs> and they had the lens right there. And I'm thinking, that I, if I hit that. Terrifying. Yeah. So I, I don't know how I'd react if you said to me, here, you hold the camera. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Here's a $20,000 uh, pocketbook. Put a hold yeah. it and point it at me. Yeah, wow. Um, <laughs> so um, a- a- any other leaps forward that that really changed the game for you? Well, that was one. I mean, from, from a career point of view, uh, the look of films changed a lot. So in the 90s, when I was a camera operator, we were doing all these uh, – network, you know, NBC, CBS, ABC. I mean, there was basically the, those three and then there was Fox. So there were four choices that you could watch TV on in the early 90s. Right. And that's why there were so many TV movies being made is that uh, they needed the product. And so we would go as a camera operator, would go one from the next, but they all had a very certain kind of look. They all looked the same. The networks like the shows bright. The network like that, you know, bright, overlit, kind of enhanced reality. And then... Suddenly, uh, in 96, I got hired on the X-Files in season three of the X-Files. That, that show got so big that they split the unit into two, the crew into two units working around the clock. It wasn't a main unit, second unit. It was two full units of like 100 people each wow. working five days a week. For, so episodes were unrealistically budgeted. And, and we, we would shoot 15 days on an episode of TV, which has never been done since. I mean, we'd have two units going eight days. And that's why that had such a great look. But they were the producers really wanted it to look different. And it became a game changer. That that set the tone that show for how dark and moody things could be on television. And I remember in the job interview, when they interviewed me to, to be the cinematographer, they said, look, they said, we will never fire you. If something is too dark, we'll just shoot it again. If you've made something too dark, and we don't like it, we'll just film it again. Said, but if you make something too bright, you're gone the next day. We won't have you back. They were so, they were so against making the show bright and kind of mainstream network that that was, those were the marching orders. So that was a game changer. And out of that, I mean, that was such a successful show that it launched my career. And then the trouble was how the hell to get out of the dark look. Movie, something that wasn't dark in X Files. Like no one wanted to hear from me. They wanted me for. I did a show next called The Crow as a DP, which was right. again based on. Then, then uh, you know, Masters of Horror. You know, all these dark things. And and uh, it was. It took a lot of convincing to say, listen, I can do. I can do a comedy. I can do romantic. So that that in itself, the look of film was a game changer. A look of television. At the time, it, through the 90s to 2000s was a game changer. And finally now, it's this is the golden age of TV right now with all the streaming platforms, the types of product that's being done. All the actors want to be on, you know, on Netflix, on Amazon, on Apple. All the directors want to work for the streaming streamers. Why? Because that's where the interesting scripts are and stories are. Right. The features are just tentpole features now. It's all superhero movies. So yeah. It, that in itself has changed my job and the job of the director because they want television to look much more cinematic now. And they want to give, so it's no longer a close-up medium where you're just cutting from well-lit face to well-lit face. Right. So huge change. Right. Uh, we did have a question pop in here. Um, uh, Daniel Nero wants to know if you've had any experience with in intimacy coordinators on explicit scenes and are they helpful for the camera department or do they get in your way? Uh, hi, Daniel. So this is a pretty new thing, the intimacy coordinator thing. I think it was only introduced a year and a half ago or two years ago at uh, yeah. I think uh, HBO and Netflix started. We, and we, don't, we don't need them anymore now because COVID well, is COVID can't be taking care of it for us. <laughs> it's self-policing now. Uh, I know as a mandate, Netflix from now on will insist, as I think all of the streaming networks, I don't do a lot of broadcast or network TV, uh, but I know the streamers uh, all insist on a intimacy coordinator. It certainly helps. One thing that we've discussed and I've been involved with is the Directors Guild is doing a thing where they don't want the intimacy coordinator to turn into the director. Uh, because that's a that's a thing. You still want to get the director's vision uh, onto the screen, and I still have to I still have to uh, service that vision. But yeah. but 
the intimacy coordinator obviously is is there for uh, safety reasons, guidelines, protocol, obviously, and not stepping over the line to make sure the actors are comfortable. So really, it doesn't affect me other than it may slow down our day a bit uh, mm -hmm. when we're shooting because everything has to be passed by the intimacy coordinator before we shoot. Um, but it's a it's a necessary thing, and I think that we're just all going to have to get used to that. And that person will end up becoming just like the first AD on a set or just a very normal part of, of shooting from now on. Similar to, uh, I always think of them as sort of a counterpart to a fight uh, fight coordinator. Yeah, stunt coordinator, fight coordinator. Exactly yeah. right. That's Ma exactly. Making sure that in this aspect, we're telling the story and making sure everybody is safe. Right. But there yeah. is that delicate line with the, with the director where the director still gets to decide what that story is. And uh, by the way, it, the background of these intimate scenes are much more complex and I'm sure a lot of the actors out there have done them. Basically, you have to you have to sign an intimacy rider, you have to, you know, they have to discuss the production has to discuss with you well in advance of the shooting day exactly what's going to happen or what they want to happen. You have to sign off on it. So, prep is king in all of these things and including in these love scenes. Uh if you go in and everyone knows what's going to happen and what to expect, then there aren't going to be any shocks for anybody, including the intimacy right. coordinator or the actors. I don't, I don't, I don't require that. any of those riders or anything like that because <laughs> it's the only social life that I have. Um, so, so, you know, bring it on. No. <laughs> um, oh, that's awesome. We do have a, another question here from Chloe Lees. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that right, uh, who, oh, terrific, an incoming Chapman film production student. Oh, nice. So she she may be a, a uh, student of mine this fall, uh, depending on whether she's taking one of my classes. She wants to know what is the most surprising thing to come out of your career. Okay, so there's different, hi, Chloe. Uh, I'm glad you're enjoying this. I, I think that, you know, there's different aspects of surprising. I didn't, when I got out of film school back in the early 80s, I didn't really even know the extent or, or I, I knew I wanted to be a cinematographer. I, you know, coming out of college, I thought I knew it all. I didn't know anything. And I had no idea how much you learn by osmosis, how much you learn by being on a set. So kind of working your way up. Um, but really that's, that's the most surprising thing is, is if, if, you have, if you're creative and you have a good eye, the, the technical stuff just kind of, you, you kind of soak it in and it becomes, you don't even think about it. I haven't thought about a technical thing or a problem in years. I'm much more interested in what, what am I gonna do to make this story more interesting and more visual and more, uh, more pleasing to the viewer? How do I tell the story? Um, so that's, that part's been surprising to me. And the rest is how, you know, I, you know, what part of I enjoy the most? Well, I enjoy period pieces, for example. I talked to Matt about this a little earlier. I, a period piece for me is fun because it takes you into another world. So I often get asked at these on these talks, what 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 genre do I like the best? And it doesn't have to be a specific period. We did Aquarius together, which was the, the 60s. And that to me completely took me into like when I was a little boy in the late 60s and and how I remembered things, the telephone and pieces of furniture and it's just an amazing part of the business that you get swept up into and you're on the set and you feel completely blown away by the memories that come floor, you know, come flooding back into your head. So that's also been very interesting. You mentioned that thing from the, uh, the telephone from the sixties. Yeah. Have you seen that wonderful video? There's a video on YouTube of a father who I think he offered his two teenage sons he gave them a slip of paper with a phone number on it and a rotary phone. And he said, I'll give you $50 if you can figure out how to oh, dial awesome. this number. And they, they couldn't figure out how to dial the phone number on oh. the rotary phone. Well, even, even more, there's been, the, I thought what you were talking about, there's one a couple of days ago where the father asked, there's three different generations of kids and asked the first one, if, if what's your symbol for, give me a phone call, give me a call. What's your hand gesture if you want to? And and the first one went like, you know, like this, like right? That. And yeah. then the second one just like this, right? And just like a like a flat iPhone. Right. This is no longer, there's no longer a handset, right? 
And right. then the third, which was hilarious. And then the third one was just like, you know, it was not even, not, not even held to the ear. Not right? even held to the ear. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's, that's a sign of the times for sure. I never thought of that. That is so funny. <laughs> Um, I want to shift gears for a moment because yeah. I, I, I'm I'm hoping that some of the, my folks who are watching are uh, from the the acting side rather yeah. than the um, what what do when when you have somebody come on to a show who is a a new actor, okay, a young actor or perhaps coming from stage has never done television before uh, or film, what um, what what what's the first, what are the things you would want them to know when they step onto your set? Ah, okay, that's a good question. I think well, a couple of things. I'm uh, luckily I'm old enough and was fortunate enough to start as a camera assistant early enough that I got to work with a few of the studio trained actors in the business, and there were very few left. But I'm talking so I, I the the film in China was called Iron Road that featured Peter O'Toole. So I was with Peter O'Toole for six weeks in China. The uh, the one I did in Europe as a camera operator, TV movie, had uh, Omar Sharif in it. So you got these people, Diana Rigg, um, Art Carney, which goes way back. I mean, people of that era, actors, they right. were all studio trained. And so they would know, uh, Angela Lansbury worked with her. They would know exactly where and what the camera was doing at one time, at any time. So they knew if they stood in front of that camera, they knew that it's an over the shoulder onto them. They knew that they, they'd sometimes they'd signal, signal me, they'd go, and I'd go. And uh, they knew exactly how much level of performance to give based on their, the size of the lens, how not to over. So that's huge because I often, I, I can't tell you how often we struggle with, with doing over the shoulder shots, for example, and the person whose shoulder we're over, the actor whose shoulder we over, completely starts dominating and moving their shoulder into the frame. So we end up having to move the camera to accommodate, which then ends up ruining the lighting, ruining the lighting on the actor that's facing the camera. Right. Now suddenly there's a big no shadow. Now there's so hitting your marks, hugely important. I mean, I, I can't tell you how much hitting your marks without looking down at the mark is on a on a set. I can't tell you how many cases or takes we've blown where we or a camera operator can see the actor moving up and looking down at the mark to make sure it's there. I mean, the it'll combo, look like Spencer Tracy. Spencer yeah, Tracy. Or, yeah. Peter Falk. I mean, that was famous. You know, his whole thing was, well, excuse And he'd look down and he'd, you know, and that was the looking down was looking at the mark and it became his trademark yeah. on the Columbo series. And that, but that is huge because it will blow so many takes and you'll look way better. If you accommodate the actor that you're acting against, they will look better. And then when it's your turn, you will look better if you know where where and what the camera is doing. Uh, and that's a huge thing. Stillness also, because uh, um, so many of my students who I who I work with come into class and they can't talk without moving their heads. They can't and talk you, without, without. I'm one of those people. I'm not an actor, and that's why you can tell I'm doing this on the because I can see myself on the thing, and it drives me nuts. But you're right, and that's a huge deal. Not for two reasons. One, the frame. You know, the operator's going to have to do this, and it gets distracting. Secondly, I think that if you move a little too far off, and you're moving, the focus is going to go. I mean, the poor camera assistants, especially. It's in vogue right now to do very shallow focus shows. The background extremely out of focus. Why? Yeah because they want it to look more like a feature film. So shallow depth of field. So if right. you start moving all over the place, you're, they're gonna be chasing you with the focus all the time. It doesn't mean you have to be a rock. It's just whatever you show in a rehearsal to the crew, to the operator and the camera assistant, whatever you stick by that. Right. Stand ups, any operator will, will thank me for this. You're sitting at a table in a scene and you go to stand up to leave, don't yep. rock it up. Don't rock it up because we're going to do it six times to try and get the camera to move up with you at the same time. It's a bit of a cheat. It's almost like doing a banana where you kind of loop around a bit. It's a, You just slow the pace down as you stand up slightly. It doesn't right. have to look fake. But just remember that there's like an 80-pound camera with a 200-pound person behind it trying to rise up at the rate you're at. Right. And it doesn't, so those kind of disciplines of how, of knowing the camera and feeling where it's physically in the space, I think is a huge advantage. 
what about the famous um, uh, my cocaine uh, line about uh, when it's your close up looking at the eye and I'm looking at you looking at the eye, your eye closer to the camera lens. The tighter the eye line, always better. I mean, we often, you know, now again, because we're trying to make things look like features, often we'll, and we're sometimes closer on a wider lens. Get Shorty, for example, was famous, our series for, for that. Our, our standard close-up lens was a 28 millimeter lens, which meant I as a camera, I as a camera and a camera operator would be two and a half, three feet from you do, doing your close-up. So what that meant is when we were doing off camera stuff, when you're looking at an actor over on the right, it would look way too wide. It would look like you're looking halfway well, I think across. I remember you gave me a piece of tape on the Yeah, on the lens sometimes we'll do that. We don't like to do that because I think it distracts the actors. It's hard to, when you've got the real actor here next to the mat box and they're having to look at a piece of tape, but sometimes it's a necessary evil. But the, the fact, what, what, he's, what the thing is about the closer eye, looking at the closer eye to the camera, right. Absolutely right. The I actually don't like there. to look at the other actor. I'd rather look at the <laughs> tape most of the time. I've heard that a few times. Depending on who you're working with, right? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you get more from a piece of tape than some of these actors. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, somebody here, uh, Zaid Ezeldine, is that somebody you know? They're saying, hey, Attila. Why does that name sound familiar? Sounds like maybe it's somebody you've worked with. He says, hey, Attila, here, he, I'll pop his question up for you. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah. What is the biggest mistake you see new cinematographers making, or what was one of your mistakes early on in your career? Oh, great. Okay. So um, one of the biggest mistakes is overlighting. Less is more. So one thing I learned uh, – uh, so I, I've had these Hungarian mentors. I had Vilma Zsigmond here in LA. I had Laszlo Kovács here in LA and I had Laszlo George in Canada. So three Hungarians all coming out of the same film school in Budapest. And they all had the same message to convey, which is it's not the light you add, it's the light you take away. In other uh. words, don't overlight stuff. It's like they, one of the lessons that they always talked about was they were, they were told to write down or write an essay about what the most beautiful lighting setup they had ever seen in their life. And it, you know, but that they had walked up, walked in on a scene. And 95% of the students wrote about the sun coming into some building somewhere, meaning one source, the sun. It was one light. And it was the most, you know, it came through the stained glass windows through the church, or it came through a, you know, a fan shaft, or there were windows and it was smoky. And everyone re recalled the same thing about how beautiful that was. And the, the instructor said, the professor said, yeah, well, what's the common denominator is it's one light <laughs> doing all that instead of no one said, oh, well, you know, I, the lighting when I walked into some building, it was, it was all about natural. So less is more. Don't overfill. You don't need all that fill light. These cameras these days, any camera, you're lucky in this time to be a cinematography student because you can shoot a feature film on an iPhone and, right. uh, and, and in pretty good quality. And we never had that. When I went to school, uh, we had free crew, free equipment, free um, editing equipment, post stuff. Everything was free to, to do your short film. All we had to pay for was film stock and processing and uh, little, you know, some materials. Four thousand dollars to do a three-minute film in the late '70s. That's what it cost me. So for four grand now, you can do a feature and release it. I mean, it, it yeah. sounds crazy, but yeah. you literally. You literally can win multiple awards at film festivals uh, for that kind of investment. So don't overdo it. Don't overlight. That's the biggest lesson. Um, I'm going to have to have you uh, down as a guest down at Chapman uh, at some point when when we're allowed to go places. That would be a good thing. I'd handle it happily. Uh, Daniel's got another question about actors and makeup. Uh do you have a discussion with the makeup department about what you, how you're lighting, what you need things to look like, or do they? It depends on the series. Obviously, the, the, the big advantage now of HD is that what you see is what you get. Uh, you know, we have the best monitors on, on set, you know, the $20,000 uh, uh, OLED monitors that we're judging this stuff on. Um, so 
we can both see it, but obviously every show has a certain look. And so right away, if I see something, we'll be watching for that constantly, as will the makeup and hair people. They'll be watching monitors if they're attentive. And uh, we'll, we'll spot that right away. You'll have a, in the tone meeting before an episode starts, every director uh, has a tone meeting on the story. They have a concept meeting about the, about the overall idea for the show. And in the production meeting and a private departmental meeting, every episode gets this, by the way, every, every episode of a show, makeup and hair will have their own meeting with the director to discuss things. And if I, I usually have weigh in on this as well, because I will say our past experience has shown, you know, don't overdo this. Luckily, the makeup people on a show know more about the show usually than the directors do because they're there the whole time. Right. So we're, all, we're already in sync in a lot of ways. But if there's something special, and I know there's going to be a scene that's in a lightning storm or that's going to be, you know, a rain effect or bright blue light or, you know, we'll discuss that with makeup so to make sure that it's not overdone and you won't see the makeup. That's, mm -hmm. that's the big thing. Mm -hmm. What about um, actors who you've worked with um, who have been uh, seasoned pros? You mentioned the um, the the folks who were uh, studio trained. Mm -hmm. um, anybody in particular teach you one great lesson from an actor? An actor teaching a great lesson? I just so. The biggest thing is, and it's not even a lesson that I can use because I'm not an actor, but, but what I see from right. that actor that other, or those actors uh, that others don't do is, uh, is that every take will be slightly, a, a slight variation. Once the director gets what they want, uh, mm -hmm. which is pretty quick on television, as you know, Matt, you know, you'll do like two or three takes max, right? But yeah. good directors, first of all, will say, would you like one for you? Or let's do one for the pleasure. That the, our guys on Get Shorty would say that all the time, both, uh, yeah, so go, let's do one for the pleasure where, where now you get to do what you wanna do. But when I've watched people like Al Pacino, when I watched Robin Williams, when I watched you know, from behind the lens, these guys would get on and they would, every take would have slight variances in them and subtle, very subtle ones. And you you immediately, you know, as a as behind the monitor watching you take note, and you go, oh my God, this gives this gives the director such a variety and the editor later. Right. It doesn't mean the mark of what you're intended to do or what your task is, but just these little subtle differences mean everything. And I, I think that's a great lesson. Yeah. It's so funny, you know, coming in um, uh, as you, I'm coming in as a guest. I haven't been a series regular i've i've had a i had a recurring role for a couple of years on a sydney lumet show which was an amazing experience uh watching him work mm -hmm. um i remember one one uh moment where uh we were shooting a courtroom scene with three cameras and uh he's telling them where to set up and uh he said to one of the operators he said you know and you'll be over there on a half apple and the guy said, uh, I think a pancake. And Sydney, Sydney turned back to him and said, really? And the guy said, yeah, I think a pancake will do it. And Sydney said, <laughs> Sydney said, okay. And then we finished the rehearsal and the camera operator was like, uh, I have to swap out the pancake for a half apple. And <laughs> I, I learned so much from that moment. First of all, seeing that Sydney knew everybody's job because he'd come up through through live television and and had had been in the industry that that long that he knew half apple versus pan I mean how many directors will know that right um and then the fact that when the guy contradicted him he didn't argue with him because he knew he'll he'll figure it out in the rehearsal that's funny you're and right. it, it was a great lesson in how to handle a, a set, you know, just that that level of knowledge and that level of confidence of not having to, you know, come in with an iron grip and say, no, do it my way. He, he knew the guy would figure it out. Um, but um, there was some other point to that story, and now it's... I mean, I, I think. Gotten away no, from. 
the more the more as an actor because we're still talking about actors i know uh, the, the more as an actor you're prepared on the day that you when you arrive on the set because the blocking for example in that private blocking we were going we were talking about it's going to change as a director you can't be so stiff that you that your mind is made up this is the only way i'm going to do it because the actors are always going to have a say in my character wouldn't do this i would i really stand against the window there's always something uh, the the DP is going to say, look, if you know if, if they don't stand against the white wall, they're going to look better. Why don't we have them, you know, come in through the room so that this, you know, they look great with the background. So there's all everyone's got an angle on this, and the more as an actor that you're prepared to roll with those punches, it's the same as with a direct. It's the same right. advice I'd give a director, same advice as I'd give a DP. The more you're willing to collaborate and be flexible a little bit, and still maintain what you want for the character. The better it's going to look, the better you're going to look, and the smoother the shooting's going to go. And, and the you're going to get called back. The more you know about everybody else's job too, and why they may be asking you to do what it is they're asking you to do. Absolutely, um, absolutely. They're not I trying mean, to trying step to on your performance. Your they're trying to help your performance most of the time. I mean, absolutely. And all all actors. I mean, you have to have a certain sense of vanity to, to do what you do. You have to have a certain sense of of, of uh, uh, ego to be an actor, obviously, we all know that. I think that one of the things that all camera operators use, and it's not a trick, it's just the truth, is that you know a, a couple of takes are blown where the actor has missed the mark and they're turned a little too far to the left or they're looking, you know, because one dictates the other. So if, if, it, if some scene turns into an over shoulder shot and if the actor facing the camera has gone a little far to the left, the camera will compensate. The cam a good camera operator will compensate but it's right. gonna blow the lighting. So I will go over and I'll say, listen, I'll say, Matt, you know, that last take was great, but I said, you know, I, I'm, I've got a light, a big sunlight behind your head. And if you turn too far, it hits your nose and puts an ugly nose, a, a nose hit on, on the tip of your nose. I so, remember you saying that to me on Aquarius. And, and right away, that's not a technical note suddenly. It's not like, oh, you know, I don't care about the light. I right. care about my performance. No, you go, I care about my nose looking lousy because there's going to be a hard uh, pyramid of bright light on the, on the tip of my nose. Yeah. So you've got to kind of play that game and know that, but everyone's working on the same team. Everyone's trying to make you look your best as an actor. So uh, we have another question. And then I want to jump into maybe looking at some of these pictures from Pillars of uh, the Earth. Um, how does your relationship with the departments, acting, production, et cetera, change depending on the expe your, your expectations of your camera crew? Do you ask your AC to take on additional responsibilities on that note? Oh, okay. So that uh, so part of it is um, it's a different style here. Like I grew up, uh, you know, I was born in Hungary. I was trained by Hungarian cinematographers. I grew up in Canada. I've been living in LA for 11 years now but I've shot all over the world and some use the European system and some use the American system with their camera crew. So European system, uh, if you work on a feature in England, for example, the camera operator has a lot more uh, freedom and leeway to work and collaborate with the director and the actors uh, compared to the States. You have an American director of photography. They'll likely often set up the shots themselves. They'll sit behind the camera and, and set the dolly track and, and often, now TV's changing that because of the pace we're going at, but I like to work in the European style where I give way more freedom creatively to my team. So I let the camera operator freely discuss with the director any changes they want made, any, uh, while I'm doing the lighting for a scene, they're not having to wait for me to sit behind the camera and figure out the shot. They know the parameters, you know, we're gonna dolly from A to B, and the actor's gonna walk from there to there. And they do all of that work and it gives them way more creative creativity. The focus puller, the first AC, I let them first have a crack completely at when the timing is to, to rack focus from your face to your face, one actor to the other, stuff right. like that. And the more the freedom that you give that way, I find the better the end result and the more joyfully the, and, and better, I mean, quality goes up of the people doing that job. So that's, that's my answer is I let them take as much creative control as I possibly can. Okay. We have another question from an incoming uh, student at Chapman at Dodge Film School. What cinematography styles, techniques are you looking to develop in the future? 
This is from Noah Samaria, who also could possibly end up having to suffer through me in the fall. We'll see. <laughs> I mean, right now, and this is a, sadly, this is a COVID related thing. We're getting all kinds of, so I'm on a Netflix show called The Society. I'm about to, I'm waiting to go back to Boston. I did the first season. Uh, and a lot of this show is handheld, as I mentioned earlier. So suddenly we're getting direct as well. How do we get the camera back further from the actors? How do we, you know, what's the possibility of using a remote head on a dolly so that the camera operator isn't near the actors at all? There's all these kinds of styles that are, are unfortunately being dictated. I'm getting all kinds of emails, as most of us are right now, VPs, about virtual backgrounds, about not leaving the studio and creating some plate shots with, uh, with a second unit or with a visual effects team and then putting the actors in so they don't have to go on location. It's a bit of a nightmare actually, because it's exactly the opposite way of what I was enjoying, which is the cameras are so sensitive now and the, the quality is so high that you can, you can shoot anywhere with minimal light and, and get an amazing look. Again, it's not the light you add, it's the light you take away. So wherever you'd add small lights and flag off a bunch of light, you can end up with a beautiful scene with minimalist stuff. The issue is the COVID right now, because minimalist stuff requires that you're close to the actor, you're on location, you're handheld, you're in, you know, you're, you're, it's a much more kind of organic feeling filmmaking. And I don't know what the hell is going to happen with that until there's some kind of vaccine, because in order to do that kind of filmmaking, you're going to be breaking all kinds of rules that they're throwing at us right now. Right. And I was wondering, you know, uh, are you going to have to be shooting scenes in with, uh, how to put it, you know, not trying to do things without a master with the two, like ways to make the actors look like they're right next to each other when they're maintaining some distance? Well, not only, yes, and not only that, but an even bigger problem to that. Yes, yes, there's discussions. One of a lot of these emails coming in right now about is how to stitch together backgrounds so you can have an actor four inches from the other or six shouting at each other, and yet they're really in a two shot, and yet right. they're not. You know, the backgrounds are stitched, the performances are stitched. But the bigger issue, for example, I mean, this is a crazy. So on, on the society, we have a the, the small town and there's a, a church that's been kind of converted into a into where the, all the kids meet is Lord right. of the Flies, where all the kids meet every, well, several times in each episode. So they'll have 200 kids in a church. So I'm getting, you know, in these pews and the sunlight's coming in. It's quite a nice set. It's a set. So I got a call saying, well, how do we, how do we not have 200 kids in the same room at once? Can we tile the audience, which we've done sometimes with crowds, where you'll you'll only use like 30 kids, but change their clothes. And for the big wide shot, tile those four groups of 30 together to make it look like a full building. Just change their clothes and change right. their hair, whatever. <laughs> yes, the answer is you can do that. The problem is a lot of our actors are, we have 25 ensemble cast in that show, 25 regulars. And they often sit in this place and they interact in various parts of that church. So now how do you, it's okay to do a wide shot, but how do I get Matt? How do I get your close up talking to someone with some people in the background right behind you? And then turn around in another part of the church to get another group of actors with the same extras. You're gonna see in the as part of the audience. So the answer is no, you can't do that. You, we're gonna have to, in a way, deal with it where you have, you know, you're gonna say, look, these hundred kids are gonna have to come in here. We might be able to use 50 instead of a hundred, but it's a real nightmare right now. I mean, it's it's a crazy from a photographic point of view, just just that specific, how hard it's gonna be to get going. But what a time. It's crazy times, yeah. Yeah. Let's uh let's jump in and look at some of these uh pictures that you were talking about. Um All right, so does it work that you just put one up and I talk for a sec and then you just go to the next one? Yeah, I can share my screen and um I'm gonna hop in uh let me see. Tu, 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 tu. I don't want that one. Uh, I want, uh, we'll go to here. So uh, there we go. Yeah, there we go. Uh, right, so doesn't matter. Uh, pop up this one. Sure. So uh, 
Oh yeah, that's cool. That's gonna work. Up. Oh, uh -oh. No, hold on. Let me get that's back. Good. Is it filling the the screen? I can't. I'm not it's seeing. It's good enough. Yeah, it's good. It either gives you an idea. So I get often asked, you know, what what my favorite project was or what what favorite genre I like. And I've already mentioned I like period pieces, but um, I did this eight hour mini series, The Pillars of the Earth. Uh, it's now almost well ten years ago. It was 2009. We shot it. It came out in 2010. But uh, this was done in Hungary, um, in Budapest. And it's a 12th century period piece that Ken Follett wrote. Uh, Ken Follett uh, also wrote The Eye of the Needle, which is the famous film with Donald Sutherland. Donald Sutherland, co by coincidence, was also in this film. But the reason that I wanted to show some stills from this is the reason I love this time period or period genres like this. So eight hours of television, and I have three lighting sources to keep the audience interested. Daylight, moonlight, firelight. There was obviously no electricity. There was obviously, I mean, they had torches on walls at night, but it's flickering fire and it was minimal. So how do you keep an audience entertained? Well, luckily, if you watch this mini series, go to the next slide, sure. Uh, every scene, every scene in the show is was planned by the director, Sergio Gazan and I, to be backlit. So there's very, the, we, we chased the sun around uh, this is a battle sequence that we did. Uh, and there's some smoke machines going back there, you can see, but th this was kind of a gray day, so it doesn't apply, but it's just, a, it gives you the scale. And then the next one. Um, wow. Okay. So, you know, 50 stuntmen on horseback, another 100 stuntmen uh, uh, battling on the ground. It was a lot of, uh, lot of action and a lot of coordination. But again, how fun is that? You're suddenly in this world and you're seeing all these like 12th century battles going on and you completely get immersed in it. Uh, so yeah, so what's the next one? Uh, that's a set. So this is what I was saying about the planning. The backlight here, uh, th th so this is the Priory where uh, Matthew McFadden is one of the actors in it, uh, Ian McShane. And this is the Priory that they live in. And we built it one way, and this was facing uh, uh, southeast. So in the mornings, we would film this way. Actually, uh, southwest. In the afternoons, we'd film this way, and it would always be backlit. You get this beautiful looking set that didn't feel like a set at all. Because the set would always be up behind, and it would give you this creative wow. look. Wow. Um, you'll see. Yeah. So in tears now. Again, you're in a period piece, and I had all these. When I remember when I said I was, I would read a script and say, "This, this reminds me of," uh, you know, I knew right away what this would look like. Reading it, I thought, "Oh my God, I'm going to put light shining through the stained glass of this church that's being built, and it's going to do a kaleidoscope of color all over everyone." Until I was told that they didn't have stained glass in the 12th century. Those windows that you see back there, how they made translucent material is they, melt, they, they took bone, cattle bones and bones, and they basically melt it down into like this paste. And then they paint the paste onto a surface. And then when it dried, it became a window. And that's how they built these things. So there was no color. There was no stained glass. There was not, I had to throw all that out the window. So this is how we, we created the look. In this case, it's a sunset, the sun coming in the back, and uh, you see what it kind of looks like. Next one. All right. Uh... Yeah. So again, this this just shows again trying to get some shadows and long shadows in a give some mood to a scene. Uh, this was a set. It was uh, you'll see. You go on to the next one, Matt, because it, it continues. The, the okay. set was uh, 27 feet high. <laughs> There's a good example right there. And the concept you'll see coming up is they're in this cathedral that's being built, and suddenly the roof collapses because the architecturally it hasn't been designed well, and the roof collapses on these people. So the green screen you see above. Uh, was where there was no set at the 27 feet. That was a little lower than 27, that green. But basically, we did have a set to 27 feet. And then in the next picture or two, you'll see what happens. But trying to create a mood. So these rocks, the, the, as the ceiling collapses, we had actors, stunt people, and uh, basically the roof collapses. And then there's a wide shot showing the stunt stuff and how it worked. Uh -huh. Wow, yeah, that's 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 kind of a frame grab from the show, and uh, basically, you know, there, there was we were in there for three days filming the sequence. I mean, it was a big deal. But you'll see in a wider 
shot the the ceiling. Okay, so if you look up there above the crane and the ceiling, you see these that's this kind of that truss, rock and roll metal truss, and they're they're loaded with buckets of rocks, which are of course styrofoam and lighter weight cork and things, all painted up, and uh, that's what gets dumped on cue onto the onto the actors and the and the uh, stunt people, uh, and you know then we'd have some heavier stuff falling onto stunt people, so it looked more realistic. So anyway, that gives you an idea of the the kind of work that goes on. This is the frame grab. Again, keeping people interested for eight hours, you've got some candles in the chandelier there. Well, how do you do it that it's not a flat looking space? Well, there were little windows in those places and that's what it is, is a little sliver of light coming in from the right, uh, illuminating our actors. That's Haley, uh, that's, uh, Haley Atwell walking uh -huh. the actors, yeah. And uh, we had a rule not to not to put any fake or movie lights in the ceiling. Everything was lit from the sides because that we had a real, our agenda was to make it look as realistic to the 12th century as possible. And then I think there's a couple more and I think that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. There you are. So that's, so, so that, there I am, but and to, to my left immediately is Sergio Gazan. He's the director and he's a gr amazing director. If you ever get a chance to work with him, he, uh, <coughs> He used to be Steven Spielberg's first AD. So any any Spielberg movie, like I mean the big ones, I mean uh, uh, Jurassic Park, Saving Private Ryan, Schindler's List, uh, you name the movie, uh, Minority Report, he was the first AD. And uh, Private Ryan, for example, he designed that whole D-Day inv invasion that, mm. that happens at the beginning. And Spielberg showed up one day before they shot and said, okay, show me what you've got planned out for this opening. And so that was all his handiwork. He, he directed this and uh, it was the best. He's a great director, photographic wow. memory. He had to direct all eight hours of, of it and we shot it all out of sequence. So amazing job. And you've got the whole uh, COVID thing going on. Yeah, we were smoking. Yeah, we were already pre COVID. Like, pre COVID, really pre -COVID pre yeah. Pre COVID, COVID. Uh, oh, fire, the church catches on fire. That's actually, that is, a, that is an 800 year old church in Hungary in the countryside. And uh, they wouldn't let us, of course, light it on fire, but they did let us put our movie lights in that steeple and in those where you see the light flowing with, right. with the dimmers on them. And then the visual effects people, if you see the final thing, they added flames to those windows as the place burns. But, uh, wow. Big, cool. yeah, another shot with Sergio. There. And there you are doing the universal sign of I'm a cinematographer because <laughs> only cinematographers do that hand gesture. Yes, it's the lower angle, higher angle. Yeah. <laughs> so again, back to the, this, I think the last one, or there's one more. That, that again, how do you keep the audience interested for eight hours? Well, by color. So we said, okay, look, it's a late day, it's afternoon, it's kind of, and this is almost supernaturally yellow here, right. weirdly, but it made for a great afternoon scene. And we just played that the doors were open and it was during a sunset. And that's how oh, we ended up making it look. Just stunning. But, and camera crew, camera crew. Right to work. Oh. I think that's and uh, oh yeah, this is a so Donald Southern. This is at a real castle in Austria. Uh, they let us take it over for three weeks. Uh, dirt on the ground. I mean, it's it's the real thing, and we uh, wow. we got to film this big attack there. There's the and the there's the, the there's your cast. So, unfortunately, this show was on Stars at the time when Stars was first starting. No one still gets Stars, so. Uh, it's funny, it's available on iTunes, but it, it never got, it got nominated for eight Emmy Awards, uh, won a couple, but basically not enough people saw it. It's a really good uh, miniseries, I recommend it. Well, uh, that's great. That was really great. Let's see if there's any other questions that came in while we were there. Um, well, Attila, this has been, uh, unless you've got some, you know, some favorite point that you want to make, um, I want to let you get on with your day and and just thank you so much for coming in and sharing your uh, your knowledge and experience with us. Um, I also do want to say uh, for those of you watching, make sure that you subscribe to this channel uh, because every week we're going to have uh, an actor, a cinematographer, a production designer, a showrunner, a screenwriter, somebody here talking about some aspect of writing, acting, or storytelling. 
Uh, so subscribe to the channel and make sure to click on the bell icon so you get notifications of upcoming live streams. Also, on uh, Wednesday evening, if you subscribe, you'll see that my younger brother, Anthony, who's also an actor and a filmmaker, he and I have a series, a new series on Wednesday evenings, Two Brothers Talk About Food and Movies. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about The Verdict, and we're going to have, I think, uh, one or two surprise guests to join us on that. And hop over to my website, MatthewArkinStudio.com and subscribe to my newsletter. You'll get articles uh, that I write on acting, writing, and storytelling.